welcome to the Grimmy Startup Show. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Briggy. Lou, you are a sustainability and green consultant. Uh, you have your own company and you live in New York. So tell me something about uh, your professional background. Well, so I've always had to work in areas of personal passion. And from as far back as I can remember, which is pretty far back, maybe when I was six, I always knew I wanted to be in sports. And I also knew I wasn't a good athlete which makes it a little problematic to be in sports. So I decided I wanted to be a sports announcer, tried that for a bit, and then worked in the sports business world. Very fortunate to be able to work in my passion and worked in advertising sales, branding, marketing, and promotions. Great. Then all along in parallel, I would say I was a lowercase e environmentalist. Like sports was up here as a passion, environmentalism was here. But all of that changed as a result of 9-11. I lived in New York City. Luckily, I didn't know anybody who was in the buildings, but how, you know, I was affected. What could I do? And I thought that I was inspired by the writings of Tom Friedman in the New York Times, who made the link, uh, the geopolitical link, that we in the U.S. are 4% of the world's population and 25% of the world's energy use. And we are buying our energy from these bad actors in the Middle East who then use that money that we pay them to buy off their religious fanatics who fl fly planes into buildings. So that all turned me into, okay, I got to do something. What do I do? I buy a hybrid car. I change out all my light bulbs. I end up selling the car. All of that. That felt good for a little while. But I said, I got to do this with my work. And what am I good at? Selling. Telling stories, making the story relevant to the buyer so that they feel like they are getting something of value. But in the sports world, I want to translate that into the green world. This is back in 2004 or 5. There were no jobs in it. So I said, okay, I'm going to create it on my own. And I created Lewis Brand Solutions. Lewis is my name. Passion-based sales and marketing solutions for your brand. Working in areas of personal passion, sustainability and sports and wherever those two intersect i certainly try and work in that hopefully that wasn't too long-winded no and thank you very much and actually it was a great introduction to our today's topic that we are trying to cover that's basically we will talk about to how to integrate green and sustainability practices into the everyday business life uh, even we talk about a mid-sized company or a small size company like a startup right and so I, that's why I invited you in today's uh, show, because I think you have a great experience to share with us uh, in this field. Um, because uh, the green is, is a very fashionable topic. We all know that, especially in the last five years. And uh, we all hope that by time being green, it will be like normal and uh, it will be part of the everyday life, but it somehow didn't happen, right? Th so we expected that by now, like most of the companies will have a sustainability practice, but somehow this timeline shifted and what, expect we, what was expected it didn't really happen. What happened? The crash happened. The crash, the economic crash in 2008, 2009, stopped everything in its tracks. Message to all, don't be scared of it. So how do you become greener and make that important to your customers? Well, depending, it really depends. I say become the greenest business in that category, in your competitive set, and then shout it out to your consumers. So what does that mean? Let's say you're a dry cleaner. Mm -hmm. Use dry cleaning, use the least toxic, most environmentally friendly uh, chemicals or non, don't even use quote unquote chemicals, use natural ingredients in your cleaning process and share that with your consumers. It may mean a slightly higher price, but maybe not. And you will find you will get more brand loyalty by doing it. Is, are there any statistics out there proving that by becoming a green brand, I, I get more customers from the market and I get more uh, market share. Again, green, being green 
if you take the politics out of it, is almost in, unanimously seen as a good thing. Hey, you're wasting less. That's a good business practice. You're being more friendly to the environment. You're responsive to your customers. Most customers look for this as a differentiator. Mm -hmm. If two products or services are at mm -hmm. parity, what, you know, in terms of quality and price, what are the, what brand attributes do customers, do uh, consumers care about? And environmental friendliness, caring for your community, mm -hmm. which being environmentally friendly shows that you care about the community in which you live, that resonates strongly with consumers. And again, I go back to the generational issue. The, um, I saw a study, I believe it was 2014, that showed that 80% of those 35 and under, again in the US, said that they agreed with Obama's climate change agenda. Two things about that. One, it's ver you know, aside from agreeing that you need to eat when you wake up, to get 80% agreement on any one question is really hard to do. Two, I bet most people don't know what is in Obama's climate change agenda, other than they know that he thinks it's a problem that we have to solve. And so 80% of 35 and unders yeah. are, are in that camp. So I'm a business, unless I'm reaching only retired people, I want to get to those 35 and unders because they're going to be the customers for the long haul. For the future. That's the right. The future customers. So basically, at the moment, we are talking about creating a unique selling proposition yes. by being a green brand, right? Yes, and I just want to just, yes. <laughs> for those retired people, I don't want to write them off <laughs> because what do retired people care about aside from making sure they keep their wealth and blah, blah, blah? They care about their kids and their grandkids. And if their grandkids care about this, then they're at worst are going to be neutral towards it and at most will be positive towards it. Yeah. So. Yes, it's gener generationally led by the younger generation, but they affect everything. Yes. So you just uh, came up with an example of dry cleaner, right? Yes. But these green practices can be moved all over to other industries like restaurants, oh, cafes, right? Oh, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Um, restaurants. I mean, here in New York City, there are a number of restaurants that are actively uh, be advertising and promoting their greenness. Aside from, you know, there is the healthy eating aspect of greenness, and there is that, and there is, plenty, you know, vegetarianism and all that. But then there are restaurants that take their grease that they use in their cooking and then either give it or sell it to companies that make biodiesel that come and literally at the end of the evening, they come around in a truck that's running on biodiesel, mind you, and they come and pick up that grease. That is green. They also, um, they also will, some of them will do a promotion or have it as a standard practice where 10% of the bill or 5% of the bill goes to some green charity. To me, that's gonna get people to come in again and again, as long as the food is good. Mm -hmm. And uh, even like uh, looking at the like uh, new trends that are resonating again with sustainability practices like uh, um, sharing. Sharing the economy. Economy, yeah. Like uh, sharing cars, sharing transportation, As in, sharing um, uh, space, office space, right? Yes, with like WeWork and those yeah. kind of shared office spaces. I mean, to me, businesses like Uber or Lyft have a certainly a green hue to them, especially if they're involving ride share. And in fact, just in the green sports world mm -hmm. that I uh, inhabit, there is a company in the UK um, that is a rideshare company, and they're focused on taking fans and matching them up with other fans of a certain club. So imagine it's Manchester United or Chelsea in London, and, and, and arranging rides 
especially for trips to away matches. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's becoming a thing. And they're tracking the amount of carbon emissions saved by the fact that it's not two or three cars driving, but one. And so that's a business model that I think works. Yes, and it's a very good example, like how to base your business strategy, your whole business model, completely on a sustainability practice. Oh, absolutely. So it's not, we are, at this example, we are not talking about how to differentiate ourselves, like as a dry cleaner, but it's basically how to create a company based on a green business idea. Almost any world has a green application. But you know, everything is basically, or almost everything is driven in business life by money. So being green is only, we work out long term, if is it more profitable, right? Right. For, yes. And it's also, on the other hand, more profitable, and the, on the other hand, like, cost less, or I can save on my expenses. Right. That's exactly right. Yes. Well, so you bring up a good point. And I think another kind of break mm -hmm. on the green locomotive back five, ten years ago, you know, in addition to the crash, was that, you know, green measures were expensive. You know, but now the cost of adding that solar system or investing in that energy efficiency uh, smart grid technology for your store or your business or LED lights is going down. Mm -hmm. So, and I'll, I'll go back and I'll use an example in, in sports again. So one of my clients is in the world of developing an energy efficiency template for minor league sports, that is minor league baseball and small venues and indoor sports. But, and the idea is that the Yankees and the Red Sox, if they want to put solar on Yankee Stadium or Fenway Park, they can afford it. They have $200 million payroll. But these, the, look at minor league sports as kind of mom and pop small businesses. They are going to have the same questions you just asked. You know, is it gonna, what's it going to cost? When is my payback going to be? What's it going to cost to put solar on the roof or LED lights or a new heating and um, air conditioning system? And she and we uh, have a template that analyzes all of that. And what you're finding, what we're finding is that uh, we did a, t a pilot program with a team, a minor league baseball team in Quad Cities, Iowa, and found that with with no investment on their part, they could save $24,000. A year? Uh, up front. Up front. Then, okay. if you invested that $24,000, you could find seventy-five dollars to $100,000 in annual savings. Now, in Major League Baseball, that's rounding error. That's nothing, that money. Twenty-five, seventy-five, dollars $100,000 at the minor league level? especially at the low minor league level, that's like three players, $75,000. That's big money. So they are, they said, yeah, let's it do it. It represents all utilities or it's basically more the, the lighting? It's utilities, it is, lighting, okay. water, which okay. is a huge cost. And now, especially with the drought in, in the West Coast mm -hmm. and in the desert Southwest and elsewhere, um, and also in uh, energy generation, so those are the those are the main areas yeah. that they that the that we look at. It's really interesting that you brought up this uh, example in sport because it just came into my mind that I had a guest couple of months ago who was also into like a sustainability business, and he actually developed a green product that was uh, quite shower saver. So the idea is basically very similar on a, like a startup basis that he came up with a product and he developed the product how to save money and water on a daily basis, not only in households, but also like small hotels, bread and breakfast, 
And so this is another great example how to start a business and be profitable and use green practices. And I, I think that's a great idea, one. Two, and you might say, Lou, you're biased, you're into sports. <laughs> but to me, I, I, if, I were, if I were him, I would call all the sports teams in California, which is in a crisis water-wise. And, and because sports, when you put a message through sports, it's a megaphone. Uh, I don't know, because you are really good in tennis and you like to play <sighs> tennis uh, frequently. I don't know whether you heard about there is a company uh, working on like collecting tennis balls uh, and yes. kind of like re repurposing them. Repurposing them? Yes. 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 And there is a couple of efforts in that regard. And I am I think you are overly kind in talking about <laughs> me as a good tennis player. I'll just say I'm a tennis player <laughs> and an avid one. The quality, mm, not so much. Anyway, um, yeah, I mean, I, the, you know, the impact overall in terms of carbon footprint of collecting tennis balls and doing something with them is relatively small. But the high profileness of tennis is big. And so why, you know, that and the other thing is the people who get into it for whom, you know, tennis can be a big business for them. But Lou, it's, it's, this is exactly the point. If I'm using, like, used tennis balls, nobody ever, like, wants them anymore. That's right. And this is, I'm basing my business on these tennis balls. Basically, my material costs are taken will be care zero. Of. That's right. Yes. That's right. Yes. And then, and then you will be seen by the tennis community, the people who play the game, you know, if, d depending on how these companies market themselves by the U.S. Tennis Association and other, you know, if they're an international, other governing bodies of tennis, which are very powerful organizations. And then, you, you know, it's something I'm thinking big. It's something that can be brought to something as high profile as the U.S. Open. Um, then you're talking massive publicity for something where you have zero material costs. Yes. Like, sounds pretty like a good business yeah. model. So let's stop here for a second, and uh, because your main expertise is basically mainly like the sponsorship area. That's one thing that I've focused on a fair amount lately. Yes. Yeah. So can you please tell us more about like options for like partnerships on the green business side, and as well as like possible sponsorships? Like, uh, great question. I so. Let's take a step back for a second. You know, what is sponsorship? Why does company A sponsor sports event or concert event or arts event B? Why? Because they're getting access to audience. Audience is the reason. It's not that they care about football particularly or <laughs> ballet. I mean, they might. But really, what they're interested in is reaching the people who go to those things. And getting the association with the event or the cause or the program that they love and putting their brand in association with that. I know it sounds basic, but it's important to, to go through that. No, it's a really good point. It's, so, I'm glad that we clarified it. So, now, what, so, you know, in terms of partnership and sponsorship of something green, I think it's a very, as, as we, talked about earlier, the people who care about this are a growing number. They're the millennials primarily and the Gen Xers who have grown up with this and are looking for companies and events to that advance, that, that care about this cause. And then they're going to walk with their green, i.e. their dollars, to those businesses. So. You know, to my mind, partnering with a, a green nonprofit uh, that is doing something great or a business that's, that is high profile, that has a big audience, is going to put your green brand in front of the people who care about this stuff. So what would that look like? Let's say... Let's use the minor league baseball example. Let's say that uh, that 
Team A has Green Night at the ballpark, and it's sponsored by the renewable energy company that installed the solar there. But they are going to have the green uh, dry cleaner and the green restaurant and the green retailer having tables in the parking lot at the on green night at the ballpark. You want to be, if you're that small business, you want to be in at green night at the ballpark. If you're the minor league baseball team, you want to show the businesses that you are doing, you're crossing all the green T's, you're dotting all the green I's, and you are really green so that the businesses don't have any qualms about, you know, possible greenwashing, et cetera. And so that they're going to want to come there. And then you're going to get the fan. The fans are coming to the game. They're like coming in and they're going to see you. And how that to me is, is, is an example. Um, Even like uh, we were talking about uh, like another example before the show when we mentioned that the restaurant, even the local dry cleaner, they can actually partner. They up. can partner with each other. Exactly. So and, and so green businesses in a given zip code in a given congressional district and however, in a, in a given chamber of commerce area should be talking to each other. And perhaps if you have a ticket from a dry cleaner, from the green dry cleaner, you bring that to the green restaurant, they're going to give you a couple bucks off the bill or vice versa. Yeah. So it, it's imperative for people to network with other business owners. Um, and I think it's really the, the interesting aspect that we really didn't mention deeply yet is the giving back to the society, the community aspect of yes. businesses. And so, and I think that's a simple yet important uh, and also s very positive business strategy by taking some part of the fee that you charge for whatever service or product you're, you're selling and putting that into some green cause. It's gonna, it is going to engender greater customer loyalty. But you might say, Lou, you're eating into profit right there. That's true. But if you get a customer to come back, how much is that worth to you? And yeah. if keep coming back. And perhaps you can even do a promotion that's a tell a friend. So you buy a product or service X at this store that's green. Some part of that goes to some charity. If you bring in friend your friends you get a little break yeah. and now new customers have come in so yeah you have to spend a little but you're making more and you're doing the right thing in the process but even looking at the example that for example you have a store space right that you for example you're a, a small coffee house and you are open until like 3 p.m yes. 5 p.m and after that you give your space over to the community and you open up for um Discussion. Birthday parties, like forums, like school and parenting discussions, workshops, and you can increase your income stream with a, like a second level after the closing hours. Yes, uh, that's a that's another great way to. That's kind of like making. It's kind of like the Airbnb model of <laughs> of your of a business of a of a retail business, right? Using dead time, getting income from it. I would urge a business, let's say a coffee house, we'll use that example, if they're green-minded to have one night of those nights when, you know, where the space is being used for something other than selling coffee towards a green forum or a green get-together. So that that shows, again, that shows the community that, that they're into it and people are going to come more likely to them during the day for their coffee rather than to the Starbucks, nothing against Starbucks. I would like to touch base uh, a little bit on like um, small sole owners who are trying to provide the services, any kind, let's say like uh, uh, interior designer, right? So how you can integrate green practices into your everyday business? In a case of interior designer, you can differentiate yourself by offering design services like 
not buying new furnitures, but repurposing the old furnitures oh, yeah. or maintaining the old furnitures. So kind of like you offer your service, a unique service to your customers, saving money while uh, creating a new home for them. Absolutely. That's, uh, that. yeah, that, there's, there's no question about that. Not only using uh, repurposed, you know, repurposed material, but also making sure that the material, once it is, once you are done with it, is not thrown out. So making sure that it's a cradle to cradle life cycle. And, you know, you can look at some big businesses who do that interface carpet. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Basically, brilliant company. They are, their business is office, uh, office carpet. And they now believe in there is no waste. So they throw nothing out or pretty much nothing out. And every piece of carpet you're done with, they take it, they repurpose it, it goes in to someone else. And so if, it, and you may say, oh, that's big business. But that works at the interior design level, mm -hmm. at the sole proprietor level. Mm -hmm. um, so absolutely. Lou, is there any segment of this topic that we didn't uh, touch yet? I think I think you've really covered it well. Okay, then I'm very happy that you had time to join to us today, and we had this great conversation, and we were able to give some, I believe, great recommendations and ideas to uh, mom and pop stores and even service companies and mid-sized companies as well. So thank you very much for being here. And thank you for having me, and thank you for providing this wonderful service via your show. And remember to all the uh, entrepreneurs out there that are interested in green, just remember that the millennials and the Gen Xers care about this stuff. That's who your customers are. I don't care what product, what service, and they care, so don't be afraid of it. Good comment for the end. Thank you very much. Thank you.